Good morning, my dear students. Today and the days which are going to follow us, we are going to shift ourselves to one very, very important concept in biology, what is called as environmental biology. Now, what is this environmental biology? The study of the plants and animals in relation to the environment. If you take other branches of botany, namely morphology, taxonomy, cytology, anatomy, in all these cases, we always talk about an individual plant. For example, in taxonomy, you say that Hibiscus rosa sinensis is belonging to Malvasi. So, in that topic, you are going to talk only about Hibiscus and nothing more than that. And if you are going to talk about uh, uh, root morphology, we are going to talk only about the roots in different plants, leaves in different plants, stems of different plants like that. And it is only the environmental biology which takes care of the plants and animals as it is living in the environment. <coughs> So, the behavior of the plant, when it, is a, when it is studied along with the environment, is a beautiful study. <clears throat> Particularly in animals, it is a very, very, very interesting, it is a very, very fascinating area in biology. How the birds are making their beautiful voice in the early morning, how they are behaving in the brooding season, how the birds are laying their eggs how the young ones are coming out of the eggs and how the young ones once again learn all the things as their father and mother. Behavioral science, behavioral biology in zoology is a very interesting area. How the elephants are moving from one forest to another forest on what they are feeding, how they are breeding, what type of life they are living in a forest. Really, it is a Fantastic to know about all these things. So, <clears throat> the study of the plants and animals as it is living in an environment is what is called as an environmental biology. <clears throat> in most of the universities at a very higher level, they have got a botany department and a zoology department, but they have got a separate environmental biology department. <clears throat> because the botany and the zoology, they are very different. And the environmental biology is, even though it is a half shoot of botany and zoology, it has got its own entity. It has got its own entity. So there, the perception is a totally different. You view a plant as it is living in an environment. So that becomes a different, totally different concept. Okay. <clears throat> so it is into this aspect. It is into this arena we are going to enter today and then we will be in this field for five or six more days because it has to be discussed very elaborately. How a plant is uh, acting with its biotic factors, the abiotic factors, what is the population, what are the different problems that we come across in an environment and uh, what is the pollution, what are the causes for the pollution. So, different areas we are going to cover under this broad aspect called environmental biology. So, that goes by a broad topic called organism and environment. As I was telling you, today we are going to talk only about uh, organisms, organisms as an individual. Then, organism as a collection is a called as a population. In another class, a second class, I will be talking about the population. Likewise, slowly we will move to one area to another area. So, today's discussion, my discussion is going to be only on organism as an individual structure. Okay? That's good. <clears throat> so, ecology is basically concerned with the four levels of a biological organization. One, <clears throat> at an organism level. Second, at a population level, then at a community level, then finally, biomes. 
So community level means uh, organism level. Today I am going to discuss how it is a forming a population. We will be discussing in the next class. Then different uh, populations are forming the community. What is a community? For example, <coughs> pond is a community. Forest, I mean, uh, uh, grassland is another community. And then a uh, man made park is a third community. So, in this, the plants are in aggregation and then they form a particular community. So, these are all different communities. So, we study the plants at a community level also. In a particular pond, what are the different type of plants that will be growing? In the center of the pond, what which plant will be growing? In the periphery of the pond, which plant will be growing? And just along the sides of the shores or at the banks of the rivers, which type of plants will grow? So these are all coming into the communities. Different communities form what are called as a biomes. Biomes means it's a, it's a very large level. You have got a tundra forest, a tropical forest, a temperate forest, a subtropical forest. All are regions. So, biomes are uh, the, the, the biggest size of an environmental study is called as a biome. So, from one to another it is increasing. Hundreds of organisms, they form a population. Many populations, they form a community. Many communities, they form a biome. Like that, it is uh, going from one level to the another level. Now, I think you would have very clearly understood the, these uh, four things. Organism is the study of a plant as an individual organism. How they are forming different populations is the next level. How different populations are forming the communities is the next level. How different communities are forming a biome is the fourth level. Biome is the biggest level of the environmental study. As I was telling you, a yeah, yeah, tundra forest, an alpine forest. A tropical forest. These are all the very good examples for the biomic level. Okay? Good. <clears throat> Next. So, ecology at an organismic level. Uh, ecology at the organismic level is essentially physiological ecology. So, we talk more about the physiology here, which tries to understand how different organisms are adapted to their environments in terms of not only survival but also reproduction. So, my lecture will be mostly concentrated on the adaptation. How the different organisms are adapted to its environment at a survival level and the reproduction. At two levels, I am going to discuss this matter. How for the different physiological functions for transpiration, for photosynthesis, for respiration, how for, 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 for surviving, how a plant is adapting itself, how an animal is adapting itself for its survival is what we will be concentrating in the last 10 or 15 slides. And for successful reproduction, how the plants and animals are adapting themselves, it's a very fascinating area as I was telling you in the early, uh, in the beginning. How a plant is uh, producing the pollen grains, how it is uh, secreting the nectar to achieve the pollination, how it is uh, developing the hairs on the seeds to get its uh, seeds uh, successfully dispersed in the environment, how the plants are adapting for its uh, different environment, how they are producing the thorns and spines over their surface to safeguard themselves from the cattle. Beautiful, interesting things they are in biology. So, they are adapted, they are adapted for their survival and they are adapting themselves for the environment. How this is uh, taking place at a, a botany level and here and there I will be giving some examples from the animal side also. Nice. <coughs> Organisms and its uh, environment. Life exists not only in a favorable habitats but even in extremes and uh, harsh habitats. That we have to understand very clearly. <coughs> See, the organisms, they don't live only in a favorable climatic condition. But, but of course, that forms uh, nearly 90% of the plants and animals. We human beings also, we want to live in a very favorable climatic condition. 
and as you <coughs> in the in, in your globe equatory is supposed to be the most favorable climate for the human being also because uh, there won't be too much of rain there won't be too much of cold there won't be too much of hotness also and as you move from here to the polar region the climate becomes very harsh particularly after this level after the uh, level of the tropic of uh, cancer and tropic uh, tropic of uh, capricorn it's a very difficult when you go still go higher and higher and higher the population will be very less you will see that the human population is mostly restricted to this area and in this area the I mean, human being cannot live the same thing holds good for the plants and animals also <clears throat> so most of the forest are restricted to these areas and these are all supposed to be the difficult areas where the um, life becomes a very difficult not only for the man but also for the plants and animals but in those areas also they live that is the beauty see you and i don't live in a uh, mountain but you see there are people who are living in the top of the mountain tribals are still living in the mountains the just about uh, from the base from the foot of the uh, mountain even at a uh, 10 kilometers i mean uh, 10 feet height for 20000 feet height 30000 feet height people are living they are ready to live there and they are habituated there they have adapted their life there but understand the life there will be very difficult so this is what is called the harsh habitat so the place is a very harsh very difficult to live but remember people are living there similarly the plants and the animals they live in a, a favorable climatic condition in this area but that doesn't mean that they live there alone it lives in a harsh area also i have given a number of examples for this see in they live in a scorching rajasthan desert perpetually rain soaked uh, mehalaya forest plants are living plants and animals are living deep ocean trenches plants and animals are living in a very deep oceans they are living in the uh, torrential streams the plants and animals are living not only that <coughs> permafrost uh, polar regions they are living they live in high mountain tops boiling thermal springs stinking compost pits even our intestine is a unique habitat which is a lodging hundreds of species of microbes now you tell me now you tell me very frankly where a microorganism or a plant and animal is not living you can't pinpoint even one square millimeter i tell you you can't you can't find even 1 mm square on this earth where no organism is living they are living in the hot water they are living in the ice they live in our body they live outside your body inside your body inside your gut everywhere 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 the microorganisms are living okay so the plants and animals also they live in the favorable climatic condition they live in the harsh climatic condition they live everywhere as i was telling you you can't pinpoint even a single place in the globe where the plants and animals cannot live some go they go and then they survive there adapting themselves to that environment so this adaptation is a very beautiful and interesting topic in both plants and animals <coughs> nice good so what are the different abiotic factors which are responsible for the plant life the physico chemical what is called as an abiotic components or <coughs> temperature water light and soil so these are four things that play a very very important role in the life of a plant as well as animal why 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 we also human being also we are also affected by us. we are part of a nature we we, we call ourselves as a what is known as a man a different name you are using but understand basically you are an animal you are basically you soar from zoology point of view you are also an animal okay <clears throat> major biotic factors uh, that are affecting the plant and animal life is uh, pathogens 
pathogens are affected. Then parasites, predators, competitors. So these are all the things and these are all the biotic factors which are affecting the plant and the animal life. Now here after we are going one after another, we are going to take up first uh, the, the abiotic factors and then we will be moving on to the biotic factors. But in our today's class, I am going to consider only the abiotic factors. The uh, <coughs> association of the, of a particular plant or animal with a biotic factor is what is called as a population. Okay. So, when a particular plant is there and that plant, how it is uh, living in an environment, forming a population. So, that goes the that is the next topic. It will be forming a population along with, it, with its other biotic friends. Biotic friends, I can, I am using the word biotic friends. See, when an organism, when your angiosperm is living, surrounding that hundreds and millions and millions of microbes are also living. And uh, it, it may uh, have a support on some other plant. It may be having a parasitic relationship with another plant. It may be having a symbiotic association with the other plant. So, these are all what is called as a population. It is a forming a population. So, that we will be discussing under a separate lecture called population. Because a population study is a very interesting study. So, in my today's lecture, I am going to restrict myself to the action of the plant in relation to the abiotic factors in the form of temperature, water, soil, etc. Okay, fine. So, first I am going to discuss about your temperature. <coughs> temperature is the most ecologically relevant environmental factor. <coughs> the average temperature on land varies seasonally. It decreases progressively from the equator towards the poles and from the climbs to the mountain tops. This is what I was just now telling you. In a globe, equator is the most favorable place for any organism to live. And as you move towards the pole, it becomes unfavorable because of the chilliness, coldness. Progressively, the temperature falls. Similarly, in a, in a, in a, in a land environment, in a land environment, the base of the mountain will be very hot. And as you move towards the top of the mountain, it will be cold. Okay. So, <clears throat> the temperature decreases progressively from the equator towards the poles and from the plains to the mountain tops. It ranges from sub-zero levels in polar areas and high altitudes to more than 50 degrees Celsius in tropical desert. You see, the range from... Zero degrees, sub zero, they say sub zero. Okay, fine, I put zero. Zero to 50 degrees. From zero degrees to, as I was telling you, I must correct it to minus 20 or minus 30 degrees. <coughs> From this to this, there is a wide range, wide range of uh, uh, habitats are there. It ranges from sub zero levels in polar areas. And uh, high altitudes, it is uh, more than 50 degrees Celsius in tropical desert in summer. There are, however, unique habitats such as uh, thermal springs and uh, deep sea hydrothermal vents where average temperature exceeds 100 degrees Celsius. 100 degrees Celsius. In recent years, there has been a growing concern about a gradually increasing global warming. Global warming, a yeah, very important concept in environmental biology or ecology. A very important concept. Perhaps uh, this I will be talking in my last class of what is a global warming and uh, how the temperature of the earth is uh, going higher and higher day by day and what impact it is uh, going to have on the uh, plant population, animal population, on human. Perhaps when I am discussing this, you will understand. Soon the earth will become an unfit area for the human beings to live. It becomes unfit, totally unfit. Perhaps in a 100 or 200 years, 
nobody is uh, nobody can live on this earth we are we are taking our earth to that level we are taking our earth to that level slowly we are moving the earth to that aspect so global warming ozone depletion these are all some of the very grave problems that the human um, mankind is facing because of our modernization of course this i am going to talk in my last class uh, that's a different matter but now you understand that there has been a growing concern about the gradually increasing average global temperature how water is uh, becoming a very important uh, uh, material for the plant life water is the most important factor influencing the life of organisms <clears throat> in fact life on earth originated in water and is unsustainable without water water is the most precious thing and life is not possible without water i remember to have read somewhere else a beautiful statement a beautiful statement if at all there is going to be a third world war in this world it is going to be because of the water nations and countries they are going to fight among themselves because of water one country will have more water another country will have less water so there is going to be definitely a third world war if at all we are going to have it it is definitely going to be because of the water water is going to be the main reason for that even petroleum is not a problem for us we are not going to yeah. of course it's a, it's a one, it has become one of the important uh, consumer goods that's a different matter but we are not going to fight for it we are not going to fight for it but mankind is going to fight they are going to wage wars one country on the other when water becomes a problem I understand that so in, it is a, it is a life originated in the water but life will not be possible without a water its availability is so limited in desert but only special adapted organisms will be able to live there the productivity and the distribution of the plants is so heavily dependent on water so it is the water which is deciding what type of a plants should survive there okay it is the water which is deciding uh, climate soil all the other things sunlight all these things they play only a secondary role but primary factor is the water it is the water which is deciding what type of a plant should live in that area whether the hydrophyte or a xerophyte or a xerophyte see we classify the plants only as as a hydrophyte a xerophyte a mesophyte based only on water the when it, uh, a plant is living in the water you call it a hydrophyte when a plant is living in a desert where there is no water you call it a xerophyte okay so it is a water which is a deciding what type of a plants should uh, grow there so what is an important component the productivity and the distribution of plants is also heavily dependent on the water for aquatic organisms the quality the chemical composition ph of water becomes important the salt concentration measured on as a salinity in parts per thousand is less than 5% in land water 30 to 35% in the sea water more than 100% in some hypersaline lagoons see it is a less than 5% it is a less than 5% in normal water that we are getting if you are going to the sea water it is a 30 to 35% and it is more than 100 percentage in your saline lagoons too saltish so too too saltish see you must have heard about salt lakes salt lakes where the the water itself will be very heavy because of the very high concentration of the salt that has been dissolved in the salt different salt lakes i am here the in different parts of the world okay. but remember the plants and animals are living there also that is the beauty that is the beauty they have adapted themselves for such a harsh environments also okay nice so we have come to the third point third important uh, abiotic factor is called what is called light Many herbs and shrubs growing in forests are adapted to photosynthesis. 
optimally and are very low light conditions and because they are constantly overshadowed by tall canopied trees. Many plants are also dependent on sunlight to meet their uh, photoperiodic requirements for flowering. Many animals too, light is important in that they use a diurnal and a seasonal variations in light intensity and duration as a tools for climbing their foraging, reproductive and migratory activities. So, how light is a very important for the plant life and animal life is very interesting. A very simple example I tell you. In the morning you don't find any problem because of the mosquitoes when there is a light. The moment it is getting dark and at 6 o'clock in the evening, you see the nuisance created by the mosquitoes. They come just like a battalion and then they start attacking you. How? Because there is a change in the light. When the light fails, the mosquitoes start to come in. So you classify the animals as nocturnal animals, diurnal animals, like that. So it's all mainly depending on the light. Particularly when you go to the bed, so switching off all the lights. We don't know what power God has given to it. How it is able to see us. They come only near us. Because they are able, they, they can identify the things by the body smell. Human body is producing a lot of pheromones. And these pheromones they are able to identify. And even the total darkness, the mosquito is able to identify you and then able to come and bite. But in the light they don't come out. The light is playing a very important role for the plant life and the animal life. Okay. So, the internal body, there is a, what is known as a biological clock inside our body. This biological clock is working on the principle of light only. When there is a light, the biological clock works. And then when it is going down, when it is becoming darker, the biological clock works in a beautiful way and then it makes you to sleep. It wakes you up in the morning. All these things, how it is taking place in our body? It's because of light. It's because of light. So the light is uh, playing a vital role for all the activities in the life, particularly in the plants, photosynthesis, then transpiration. For all vital activities, you need light. Without light, these activities uh, cannot take place. And of course, the sun is the only source of light. And it is, it is the only source of all energy, in fact. All energy. So we derive our energy only from the sun. Heat comes from the sun. Light comes from the sun. So, uh, this uh, sun is, uh, sunlight is uh, uh, able to spread all its energy to all the plants and the animals. See, just imagine a condition when there is no sunlight at all for months together. For about 6 or 7 months there is no sunlight. Let's imagine, there are places of course in polar regions, 6 months of light and 6 months of darkness. Those type of, uh, I mean, regions are also existing. The man will become very, very, very lazy. See, you get energy only after seeing the sunlight. If there is no sunlight, the life becomes sluggish. You become lazy and you don't, uh, I mean, you don't feel like you're doing any work at all if there is no sunlight. So it is the sunlight which is giving the energy. So understand that light is very important for a plant life and animal life and human life. Okay. So many uh, plants are also dependent on sunlight to meet the photoperiodic requirement for flowering. Flowering is done only because of the light. Without flowering, there is no reproduction. And the plants cannot perpetuate themselves to the next generation. So these are all very important factors uh, concerned about the light. Then, the availability of light on land is closely linked with that of a temperature since the light is a source of both. So first we studied about the temperature, now we study about the light. But remember, both are affected only by the sun. Both are, for both, sun is the source for temperature as well as for the light. The source is only the sun. Okay. But deep, uh, uh, there is a more than five, five, sorry, 500 meters deep oceans. The environment is uh, perpetually dark and its inhabitants are not aware of the existence of a celestial source of energy called the sun. 
So, below 500 meters in an ocean, all the organisms which are living, they don't know what a sun is. They don't get, they don't, they, they have never seen the sun and they are not going to see the sun also. Below um, uh, 500 meters of depth, they can't see the sun. So, the, sp the spectral quality of the solar radiation is also an important life. But see, I was telling you these, these uh, four factors are playing a very important role. Temperature, light, soil, all these things are playing a very important role. Now, I am telling you that below 500 meters depth, the plants and animals, they don't see the sun at all. Then you may ask how these plants and animals are living when you are telling that these four factors are very important. I tell you, these plants and animals are adapted for that. Adaptation is a very important, very interesting topic in biology. They have adapted to live in that darkness. They have adapted to live in even that type of darkness. The UV component of the spectrum is harmful to many organisms while not all the color components of the visible spectrum are viable for marine plants living at a different depth of the ocean. So we talk about the UV component in the light. Fine. We are going to the in the abiotic component, we are going to the next very important one called soil. The nature and the properties of the soil in different places of world. It's a dependent on the climate. The, it's, it's depending on the climate, weathering process, the soil is uh, transported or sedimentary, how the soil has been formed. Rock formation we have seen. So sand formation. How the um, soil is formed, whether it has been transported or whether they are sedimentary and how soil development has occurred. So, it is depending on the, the soil formation or the type of the soil that you are getting in a particular place is depending on these factors. The climate of the place, the weathering process and how the soil was transported to that place and how the soil development has taken place. All these are contributing to type of the soil which you are getting in a particular place. There is a characteristics of the soil such as a soil composition, grain, type of the grain, whether it is a small one, larger one, medium, medium size, whether it is a clay, or it is a sand, or it is a soil, or whether it is a gravel, what type of a soil it is. Okay. And aggregation determine the percolation of water. If you take a clay, you take a clay, the soil particles will be very small, individual particles will be very small. So water particle percolation will be very, very less. Okay, you see, you, you can take, yeah, uh, this is a yeah, clay, make a hole, you make a hole in the clay, like this, and then pour water. That water will be there, the, that will not percolate and go inside because the soil, the, the clay particles are very uh, small. But when you take a sand and if you pour water, the moment you pour water, all the water will percolate and then go down. Similarly, during the drying, this water will get evaporated very quick. Your clay will not get evaporated, will not allow the evaporation very fast. It will allow the water very slowly, escape of the water also will be very slow. Here percolation will be very fast, then evaporation will also be very fast. The percolating level, the, the way in which it is going into the soil, it is all depending on what type of a soil that you are getting. So the aggregation determines the percolation and the water holding capacity. Water holding capacity is a very very important concept for the plants. So, if only a soil is able to hold the water, then the plant can survive there. Otherwise, it cannot survive. If the soil is not holding the water, then how the plants, um, then on what the plant will depend upon? You have to think. Only if a soil is having, is having a good water holding capacity, it can support the life of the plant. So, the water holding capacity is very, very important. These 
characteristics along with the parameters such as our pH, mineral composition and the topography determine to a large extent the vegetation of an area. So, so it is uh, these uh, things which are uh, which is uh, making a particular vegetation, what type of vegetation you are getting in a place. It's, it's the soil which is a uh, soil along with the water, everything they they, they decide and they determine what type of vegetation should it develop in a particular area. This in turn dictates the type of the animals that can be supported. So depending on a plant life, the animal life will also be there. See how they are intricated and then beautifully woven. Beautifully woven. When you get a particular type of a plant, you get a particular type of the animals there. And when a particular type of animals is there, particular type of microorganisms will grow there. So everything is a completely, totally interrelated in nature. And you can't understand this nature with this uh, small brain. It's uh, very difficult, very, very difficult. See, the understanding of the nature needs a yeah, very uh, deep knowledge and also a type of a devotion to the nature. When you when you completely attach yourself to the nature, then you understand how these, this life is, one is linked with the another and then how it is forming a beautiful web, what we call forms of food. Good. Responses to abiotic factors. During the course of millions of years of their existence, many species have evolved a relatively constant internal environment uh, that permits all biochemical reactions and physiological functions to proceed with maximal efficiency and thus enhance the overall fitness of the species. This constancy could be in terms of uh, optimal temperature and osmotic concentration of a body fluid. It's a beautiful concept, a beautiful concept. Responses to the abiotic factor. See, over uh, millions of years, the body is a slow, I mean, uh, it's undergoing a number of changes, both at a morphological level and as a, as a physiological level, and then it is able to fit itself into the society. This word fit, I have borrowed from Darwin. Okay. So, that which is able to modify itself, adapt itself, change itself, to the changing environment, that alone will be able to fit into the environment. Otherwise, you will be thrown away. Otherwise, you have to, you will be eliminated from the environment. That which is able to fit itself, that which is, sorry, that which is able to adapt itself to the changing environment will be able to fit itself in the society or in, a, in an environment. So, this fitting was very successful in the human population. Why human population has become a successful animal? I will explain. Because he was able to adapt himself to any type of situations. Any type of situation. This concept only we are going to study in uh, next few slides. See, ideally the organisms should try to maintain a constancy of its internal environment what is called as the, the principle of homeostasis okay <clears throat> so despite varying external environmental conditions that tend to homeostasis let us uh, take an analogy to clarify this important concept Suppose a person is able to perform his best when the temperature is uh, 25 degrees uh, Celsius and he wishes to maintain it so even when it is uh, scorchingly hot or freezingly cold outside he wants to, he, he is a more comfortable, he is a highly comfortable with a 25 degrees Celsius, let's imagine then it could be achieved at home in the car while traveling and at a workplace by using an air conditioner in summer or a heater in winter. Then his performance would always be maximal regardless of the weather around him because he is able to condition the air. So it's called air condition. 
he is able to condition the weather say, by his scientific knowledge. Here, the person's homeostasis is accomplished not through the physiological but by artificial means. But this chance, but this chance is not given to any plant or animal. Man is only having this capacity. So a plant, if it wants to enjoy always this 25 degrees Celsius, what can it do? Is it possible? It cannot have a 25 degree constant temperature throughout the year or throughout its lifetime. It cannot go and live itself in an air conditioned room. It cannot get itself heated by an heating source. It is not possible for a plant and the animal. Whereas for a human being, this is possible. So he has a homeo, homeo, principle of homeostasis. Irrespective of what temperature you are having outside, the human temperature will always be constant. So in the course of evolution, we have developed this character. So some organisms are able to maintain their homeostasis, constant temperature by physiological and sometimes behavioral means which ensues constant body temperature and a constant osmotic concentration. Very important points. All birds and mammals and a very low but a few lower vertebrate and invertebrate species are indeed capable of a such a regulation, thermoregulation as well as a, a osmoregulation. So, birds are able to do that. Some mammals are also able to do that. But a very lower form of animals, they can't do that. They cannot have a regulatory purpose in their body. So, whatever the uh, temperature in the surrounding area, that temperature will automatically come to that organism. It cannot spend energy. It cannot spend energy to maintain a constant temperature in its body. So, an organism which is spending the energy and it is able to maintain a constant temperature in your body is more fit for the society and environment because it can survive in a better way, it can adapt itself to any changing environment. So these are called as a regulators. The other one is what is called as a confirmers. And overwhelming majority of the animals and nearly all plants cannot maintain a constant internal environment. Their body temperature changes with the ambient temperature. Surrounding them, what is the surrounding temperature? That temperature, the plants and the animals, the majority of the plants, majority of the animals and all plants in the world, they 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 they, 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 are, they become or they take the temperature of the ambient temperature. Okay. In aquatic animals. The osmotic concentration of the body fluids change with that of the ambient water and the osmotic concentration. So they are called as a confirmers. These animals and plants are called confirmers. Some species have evolved the ability to regulate but only over a limited range of environmental conditions beyond which they simply confirm. See, even the human being even the human being, see, when you don't have an air condition and when you don't have a heater and when you are going to the top of a mountain, up to, up to, up to a particular level you can withstand the um, lower of the temperature. Then you must also go to some other more. For example, you, have, you must have a number of a two or three blankets to cover yourself because your body will not be... Uh, I mean, um, able to regulate the internal temperature to that of the outside temperature. Outside temperature. See, when you when when you are going into a, I mean, um, very chill climate, very cold climate, you start shaking. You know what is the reason for that? You know why your body gets a shake? See, when you are shaking your body automatically, the body is getting vibrated so that you get more energy. That is the reason for shaking. See, when you are entering into a cool temperature, your body automatically shakes. And this shaking is only due to what is called as the, to make you suitable for the lower temperature. Similarly, when you are moving to an 
a hot environment, you start sweating, sweating, sweating. The reason is when you sweat, this sweat comes out of your body and then it gets evaporated. When it is evaporating, the body temperature is getting lower. So you you are you are able to adjust to some extent, some range of temperature. When your temperature is at 25, when you need a 25 degrees Celsius, when it is uh, up to 10 degrees degrees Celsius, you can adjust. And again, up to 40 degrees, you can adjust. But after that level, when it is still lower and still higher, what will you do? Life becomes very difficult. Right, becomes very difficult. Your, your body cannot withstand that temperature and then you have to uh, take uh, some other help. Okay, beyond which they simply conform. The organism has uh, two other alternatives. So, when it is uh, going beyond this limit, what happens? You are going to study. See, there are two methods to avoid the unfavorable climatic conditions. One is a migration. A very beautiful concept in biology, particularly animals. Bird migration, animal migration is a that is the most fascinating topic for me. Uh, to be very frank, to be very frank, even though I am a botanist, I, I study a lot of uh, animal behavior also. So, how the birds, the, the study of bird cells has become a separate branch of zoology called ornithology. See, bird migration is the most interesting topic in zoology. See, the, when the bird, the, when, the, when the climate is uh, too cold, they cannot uh, survive in that particular area. So, automatically they start uh, migrating from one area to another area. Some animals are able to adapt themselves to that particular environment. So, migration is uh, one method and adaptation is the second method. Adaptation. So, first we are, I am going to uh, talk about uh, migration and then we will go to the adaptation. The organism can move away temporarily from the stressful habitat to a more hospitable area and return when stressful field is over. Many animals, particularly birds, during winter undertake a long distance of migration to more hospitable areas. It's a beautiful migration, I will tell you. When your wife uh, um, picks up your quarrel with her husband, she migrates to her mother's house. Beautiful migration. See, a temporary, when there is a stressful habitat, or a stressful habitat, she has picked up a quarrel with her husband. So the life has become stressful that particular day. So she is going to a more hospitable area. It is a more hospitable area for her, her mother's home. So a temporary migration. After this uh, problem, everything is over, she comes back. Beautiful concept. Birds also, they do that. When the temperature is uh, very low and the climatic conditions are unfavorable for them, they migrate to another place. And when the favorable climate comes, they once again come back. It's, they are not going to permanently live there. They will come back. They will come back. They will come back one day. And then they will come back to the original place. So this is what is called a migration. So to overcome this stressful period, they go, they undertake what is called as a migration. Every winter, the famous Talado National Park in Rajasthan hosts thousands of migratory birds coming from Siberia and other extremely cold northern regions. The second concept is a suspend. In bacteria, fungi, and lower plants, various kinds of thick-walled spores are formed, which help them to survive unfavorable climatic conditions. They do so by reducing their metabolic activity and going to into a date of dormancy. Another very interesting topic in seeds, seed dormancy. So, when, it is, when the climate is very cold, they become dormant. They remain their dormant stage. You get the dormancy in animals also, but it goes by a different name called hibernation. The hibernation, we call it a dormancy in plants and the hibernation in animals. The familiar cases of going into the hibernation during the winter is an example of escaping time. In animals, the organism is unable to migrate, might avoid the stress by escaping in time. So they bury themselves into the soil and then they adapt themselves to different modes. 
when there is an unfavorable climate or unfavorable situation is there some some snails and fish go into estuation to avoid summer related problems like heat and desiccation you see they some snails and fish they go into estuation so this estuation is a very different from the estuation that you are getting in the plant biology uh, in the taxonomy there you get a valvate estuation imbricate estuation twisted estuation concorded estuation and ascending imbricate descending imbricate that's a different and this is different but basically you have to understand that both are one so estuation you are able to see beautifully only when the flower is in a bud condition when the bud opens the estuation is last when the bud opens the estuation is last so what is when the bud is closed you get the estuation so what is this a bud it is only to protect the inner organ it is only to protect the inner organ so the plant the petals are in the estuation so this is when the plant when it is in a estuation it is able to protect itself so estuation even though you understand in a different way the root meaning is only same both in the plants as well as in the animals so some animals and the fish they go into estuation they protect themselves as a bud is protecting their uh, andrisium and gynesium there you are using the word estuation to avoid summer related problems like heat and desiccation under unfavorable conditions are many zooplankton species in lakes and ponds are known to enter their pass a stage of a suspended development okay another very interesting topic in biology is adaptation a very interesting topic what is adaptation it's one of the important attribute of the organism morphological physiological and behavioral that enables the organisms to survive and reproduce in its habitat many adaptations have evolved over a long evolutionary time and genetically fixed beautiful they have been produced and this adaptation their plants and animals have received because of this long evolutionary time they have slowly very slowly slowly adapted themselves to the environment have you not heard about a beautiful story of a camel stretching his neck while he cross crossing through the far desert slowly 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 over a period of thousands and thousands of years and then finally becoming a giraffe have you not heard this story but that of course one of the beautiful concepts of lamarck he only told that uh, this uh, adaptation when a camel has to pass through a desert it has to it, it, it the necessity was it had to pluck the leaves from the palm plants palm trees so it went on stretching its neck to become a giraffe and another beautiful I mean, uh, reason given by lamarck how a giraffe came from the camel we don't know whether it's a true or false we don't know but adaptations have taken place in nature how adaptations have taken place in animals so to suit itself to the various environmental changes and then it was a genetically fixed at a later date first it was not a believe so any change be any morphological behavioral change that a plant or animal is incorporating into its body structure will not be genetically affected it was a thought in that way but people now they accept that the these are morphological adaptations and these are chemical adaptations and these are behavioral adaptations will also have a say will also have an effect on the genes they say that it, it is a possible going back once again to the lamarckism what he told is the correct perhaps the subject is a so difficult a so intricate that we are not able to decide which is right and which is wrong perhaps he he, he could have been also right in saying that uh, the the particular adaptation made some changes in the genetic level and then the evolution had taken place so the adaptations would have resulted in the uh, origin of the species okay fine there's a lesser all good concepts in biology 
So many adaptations have evolved over a long evolutionary period and then genetically it was fixed. So the plants and animals, they adapt themselves to the different environments. In the absence of an external source of water, Ganguru rat in North American desert is capable of meeting all its water requirements through its internal fat oxidation in which what is a byproduct. It also has the ability to concentrate its urine so that a minimal volume of water is used to remove the excretory product. See how the rat is able to survive even when there is a drop of water is not there. It is able to oxidize, oxidize its fat. It is able to internal fat or oxidize its internal fat. Thereby, water is made as a byproduct, and on this water it is a dependent. Even the urine is made into a crystal for these animals. So it is able to adapt itself to the desert environment. Many desert plants have a yeah, thick cuticle on their uh, leaf surface and have their stomata arranged in deep pits to minimize the water loss through their transpiration. They also have a special photosynthetic pathway called CAM pathway that enables their stomata to remain closed during the daytime. Some desert plants like Opuntia have no leaves, they are reduced to spines and the photosynthetic function is taken over by flattened stems, beautiful topic in morphology also. How the, the different type of phyllos, phylloclads and uh, cladophils have become, uh, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are coming and existing in the life. These are all the modifications that they adapt themselves to the changing environment. When the plant has to live in a um, desert environment where there is no water, they, they depend on, they have to adapt themselves, they have to close the stomata, they have to find a means by which they are reducing the term, I mean, the transpiration. So the plants like Opentia, all the members of the cactaceae, those plants which are living in the desert, they are able to adapt themselves to the very extremes of their temperatures. Mammals and other colder uh, climates uh, generally have shorter years and limbs to minimize the heat loss. So this is called Allen's rule. Aquatic mammals like seals have a thick layer of fat called blubber below their skin that acts as a sort of insulator and reduces the loss of body heat. Some organisms possess adaptations that are physiological which allow them to respond quickly to their stressful situation. So, they have got shorter ears and limbs of one adaptation and some aquatic animals have thick layer of fat Two adaptations I have given here, and then some margin for as a response. This is a general one. These are two examples I have given here. Human body compensates the low oxygen availability by increasing red blood production, cell production, decreasing the binding capacity of a hemoglobin, and by increasing breathing rate. The beautiful adaptation seen by the tribals. When the tribals are living in the mountains, at the top of the mountain, so the I mean, uh, pressure is uh, very less there. So their body will be having more red blood corpuscles. So if you just uh, take the RBC count in a tribal and in a normal person, the RBC count of a tribal is always more. And they have adapted. They, uh, see, uh, evolu it has uh, come in their line. Because of over a long period they are living in the mountain tops, their body has adapted for that situation. So many tribes living in the high altitudes of Himalayas, they have higher red blood cells. Because when you go to a more I mean higher level, your body needs more oxygen to compensate that you are having more RBCs. In some mammals. <coughs> The metabolic reactions and physiological functions are proceed optimally in a narrow temperature range. In human, it is only 37 degrees. 
But there are microbes that flourish in hot springs and deep sea. Hydrothermal vents where temperature far exceed 100 degrees. Even in 100 degrees, they are able to survive by adaptation. Many fishes thrive in Antarctic waters where the temperature is always sub-zero. A large variety of marine invertebrates and fish live at great depths in the ocean where the pressure could be 100 times more than the normal atmospheric pressure that we experience. Organisms living in such extreme environments show a fascinating array of biochemical adaptations. So, adaptations are many uh, morphological adaptation, behavioral adaptation, biochemical adaptation, so many adaptations are there. See, behavioral adaptation, one example I am telling. Desert lizards manage to keep their body temperature fairly constant by behavioral means. They bask in the sun and absorb heat when their body temperature drops below the comfort zone but move to into the shade when the ambient temperature starts increasing. Some species are capable of burrowing into the soil and hide themselves to escape the above ground heat. See how these desert lizards are able to um, adjust their temperature when there is too much of a hot they go near the shade and when there is uh, mean, uh, less temperature they take a bask in the sun. So, this is a behavioral adaptation. So, like this is the plants and animals who are able to adapt with themselves. So, uh, today, the, uh, I think uh, the topic would have been so, so, so fascinating to you as, a, as it is a fascinating topic to me also, environmental biology, ecology, the most interesting topics in biology, particularly as I was telling in the morning, the animal behavioral changes and the animal behavioral patterns it's all very interesting areas and one such interesting area we are seeing today and in my next class I will be moving to a very important topic called what is called as a population. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you my dear children. Thank you.